Hello everyone, I'm Yuan and welcome to my channel of Lighthouse Pharmacology. So in this video, I'll talk about drug-induced cardiotoxicity. It's actually quite an interesting field whereby it's actually a collaboration between the cardiologist and oncologist because most of the drugs that can cause major events of cardiotoxicity are those from the cancer drugs. So both fields the experts of both fields decided to sit down to draft the prevention methods and the ways to handle if such event occurs. Right. So what do we need to know about drug-induced cardiotoxicity? First, it's about which drug has the potential to cause it because different anti-cancer drugs has a different um, ability to cause the severity of uh, cardiotoxicity. Right? So we need to know which ones are the ones that has higher risk of it. Therefore, we have to monitor them more closely. How does it cause? So in terms of its mechanism, so it differs between different drugs. And obviously, what all this information translates into clinically on how we should actually avoid it. And what to do if it actually occurs. Do we need to actually stop the treatment, for example, for the cancer? Or should we switch drugs and when should we do that? So all this will be backed up by the clinical guidelines, right? So that will go through the main clinical guidelines, which is by the European ones, so the ESMO, right? So let's dive in. Let's look at the JAMA paper, which actually monitors 42 patients who survived breast cancer, but actually experienced cardiotoxicity. So the paper concluded that it actually produce long-term impairment of the cardiopulmonary function for these individuals. So again, it, um, this reflects and confirms that the effect is irreversible in a way with long-term consequences. And it's like an alarming bell in a way to remind all of us that of uh, healthcare professionals that we should try our best in a way to prevent cardiotoxicity from occurring from this cancer patients as well. Yep, because it should not be an option that we need to choose that, you know, do you need, do you want cancer or heart issues? It, it shouldn't exist in the first place. Let's come to the question on which drugs actually can cause cardiotoxicity. So when you look at the general list and the list over here, so the first one is anthracycline. So this is the older generation drugs. Um, so the more commonly known as other is the doxorubicin, right? It can be idarubicin, ipirubicin, mitocentron. So this, are the, this is the whole class of the traditional, traditional but very effective, very useful, um, affordable in terms of its pricing. And again, it brings very good outcome and is used in various cancers. Um, so the incidence is much higher and it's dose dependent. So therefore, again, we try to limit the dose that we need to use and bear in mind this is an accumulative dose so further details we'll talk about it um, later on when we go through different individual different drugs right so but a lot of um, the other ones so this is alkylating ones like cyclophosphamide is still considered the older generation ones and the taxels um, but there's a lot of emphasis given on the newer generation of drugs like the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, so we've got the VEGFs ones in between, and got monoclonal antibodies and all. These are the newer drugs which um, can has has a very specific target uh, towards uh, certain cancer markers. Uh, but we also found that because these cancer markers that have been targeted are the ones that can play an important role in maintaining the cardiac function. So therefore, if this um, functions are inhibited, it can cause a certain degree of damage to the heart as well. Again, a bit of dose dependent as well. So there's some monitoring that we need to do for them. Next, let's move on a little bit on the how these mechanisms occur. So this will be just a very brief overview because again, every drug acts differently. There are different mechanisms of causing cardiotoxicity. So the first one here that we can look at is called electrophysiological um, perturbations, whereby it's mainly ion channel mediated. Um, so 
there's if there's an impairment in the electrical conduction of the heart, so obviously it will affect the heart function. So for example, there are certain drugs that we'll look at later on which can prolong the QT interval, right? The PQRST, the QT section. So therefore has a higher risk of precipitating an arrhythmia episode, so which is what we try to avoid or reduce the risk. The second one is on cytotoxicity, so therefore it's a direct toxicity effect on the cells per se, which is of course in this scenario it's mainly on cardiomyocytes. Uh, obviously all anti-cancer drugs would have a cytotoxicity effect because we, we use it to kill the cancer cells. So but there are certain times or most of the time the effect may not be as specific as we would like it to be so therefore some cells like the cardiac cells are more prone um, to cytotoxic effects from the for example reactive oxidative stress generated by the drugs that can cause um, toxicity or damage or death of the cardiac cells. Uh, but this one again depends on the different drugs so for example certain anti-cancer drugs it, they are more prone to get um, cytotoxicity effects on the cardiomyocytes and some are more towards the bone marrow suppression so it depends on the profile of the drug used. The third one here we look at is actually a pharmacological way as mentioned a little bit earlier on whereby uh, the, especially for the newer generation of drugs like tyrosine kinase if you inhibit the HER2 receptors, the VEGF receptors so these are the common um, pathways in a way which are activated uh, for the protection of the heart for their daily function. So if these uh, protective effects are inhibited in a way, because these are also important um, pathological effects for cancer, so it can cause it can cause predictably some damage to the heart. Right. When we look at a simple diagram here to illustrate um, the whole process of um, damage to the heart. So the main thing that we want, one of the main thing actually that we want to prevent is obviously heart failure, right? So from the name, we know that a failing heart would just has lower efficacy in pumping, which uh, translates to a lower ejection fraction, whereby there's lesser amount of blood that can be pumped out of the heart per heart contraction is not a good thing right so this is what we mainly want to uh, prevent so you can see the effect is obviously it's, it's from acute first because when the person receives a dose of oncology drug infusion right so the effect will be an acute one because there's a high exposure of the drug in the body but somehow sometimes it can translate into a chronic one which is what we want to prevent so from the reversible towards the irreversible, obviously something that you try to block it over there. Um, it starts with uh, degeneration and obviously necrosis, which is what I want to prevent because um, when the cells are dead, so imagine it's the heart per se of the shape. So if there's some patch of dead cells, it's, the heart could not function very well because we cannot actually, for our body itself or even uh, any treatment technology now, we can't actually replace those dead cells out of where it should be and to put in the new cells over there. So it will be in a way blocking the whole heart or electrical conduction or the heart pumping action which is what we want to prevent. So the inflammatory cells which try to come in and help actually could make the whole situation worse uh, which is also can be observed in uh, myocarditis so this is something that we want to prevent as well. So myocarditis again is a, it became a little bit of a hot topic in this COVID era because um, the previous um, like alpha the, the earlier um, strains of COVID has higher risk of causing myocarditis therefore there's more um, issues on the heart later on. And obviously the last part here on fibrosis is something that we want to prevent it totally because from fibrosis, the name, we know that it's a fiber add-on formation process for the heart cells, which is what we obviously want to prevent because heart, our heart, as we know, functions like a pump. So to allow it to function as a pump, it has to be able to contract and expand. So it, it has to be like a balloon-ish function, if you get what I mean. So it's supposed to be stretchable so that it can function optimally. So once there's fibrosis, it becomes very, very tricky because imagine a balloon that can't stretch. So the pumping action again will be 
terribly be impaired and another part about fibrosis is that currently we don't really have very good drugs or there's no clinically approved drugs in a way that can actually remove or, re or reverse fibrosis so therefore it becomes a very very tricky issue to treat so in a way when we look at drugs um, most of the time they're effective in a way if, 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 there's, if it doesn't touch anything structurally if you get what I mean, because we have good drugs that can target the receptors, the enzymes, the ion channels, for example. But if it's something structural changes, it's, it's not easy to tackle for uh, pharmacological treatment. Right. So this is what, again, we want to prevent because, again, it's irreversible at the moment because we don't really have drugs that can reverse uh, the whole process of damage. Right, so again, the prolonged QT interval is something that uh, it does it doesn't mention over here, but it's also something very important that of uh, cardiotoxicity that we want to prevent. In this slide, uh, it's actually a little bit of summary of some of the drugs on the potential pathophysiological mechanism that can cause damage. Right, so we've got some like five uh, FU and things that can cause endothelial injury. So to increase the risk of myocardial ischemia, which is like heart attack, right? So again, it's it's not good, of course. Some of it, like the VEGF inhibitor, so it actually, again, there's always endothelial damage. Um, it also increases the risk of thrombosis as well, so which is, again, what you want to prevent. So another part here that I would like to highlight is actually on radiotherapy. So bear in mind, a lot of cancer patients that will have uh, actually receive a combination of therapy, not just a combination of chemotherapy per se, Right, because a combination of chemotherapy is what we normally apply for, for a maximal uh, clinical benefit for the patient. Right, But there's also radiotherapy after surgery. So remember the JAMA paper that we talked about earlier on um, that we can observe a higher risk of cardiotoxicity for those breast cancer patients. Because one of the reasons is that they could be on antracyclines, which is, has higher risk of cardiotoxicity because the drug per se has such a property and for breast cancer patients so probably they'll have um, surgical removal right and after that they'll have some radiotherapy and obviously it it's one of the nearest organ to the heart if you were to do uh, radiation as well so with a combination of all this so it is a higher risk of um, resulting cardiotoxicity over here is just to emphasize and remind everyone on the fact that every drug is different based on its different mechanism of action. Therefore, its toxicity profile and effects will be different. So when um, there'll be some general rules that we can talk about, but there's also some individual notes that we need to take note when uh, we actually manage the patient. Right. Like any other diseases, what as healthcare professional, the main thing that we'll try to do is to avoid it. I mean, like avoid the disease altogether. So we will try to avoid the occurrence or the severity, if we can't avoid the occurrence, of the drug-induced or oncology drugs-induced cardiotoxicity. So there's quite some clinical guidelines available, um, like the more established, the full paper, which is um, as which is set up in 2016, but there's also newer reviews along the way. So these are the main references for this um, video. Like any other disease that we need to manage, the first thing is we need to know what are the risk factors. So who is actually at the higher risk group whereby we need to monitor more closely. So the first one is based on the therapy that they receive. So as mentioned earlier on, the antracyclines, that will be always on the top of the list because of its commonly used, right? The commonness of its effective drug use. So we have to look at, especially on the high dose because it's a cumulative effect and also on the radiation, right? Um, and some other risk factors would also be on the, pa the patient per se, which is uh, the older age. And also if the patient actually has any pre-existing cardiological cardio conditions. So for example, if the person already have uh, risk factors like hypertension, smoking, diabetes, and all which, you already know that um, the heart function at the baseline is not at its best. So you have to be more careful with them, right? And there's also another part that I'd like to put here 
it's that um, the female would be at higher risk because of the breast cancer stuff. And another one is on the pediatric population, um, we have to pay a little bit more attention as well. Uh, because bear in mind the pediatric population, um, the anthracyclines are also used for certain leukemias as well. Okay. Therefore, for patients, we need to let them go through a cardiovascular screening. Right. So the cardiovascular screening, you can see it's a very long, extensive list. Um, so some of it are the general ones. So you can see the way to evaluate is um, the methods and the techniques that we need to use is similar in a similar way that how we handle cardiology patients in the cardiology clinic, whereby um, they measure their glucose level, lipid, you do ECG, and you, you monitor their um, ejection fraction, to re which reflects the cardiac function, right? Sometimes you might need to use some contrast, you know, and things like that. So again, we try to encourage the person to stay as healthy as possible in terms of exercise and diet and stuff. So these are all similar in a way. A very general uh, diagram over here for screening and steps, right? Later on, we'll go through the individual drug ones. It's like we, it's that we need to obviously monitor the left ventricular ejection fraction, which is the LVEF over here. So if it's anthracycline, so you have to treat LV, the, the heart issues if anything occurs. So, and also um, any, obvious, obviously monitor any biomarkers as well, like the uh, naturally uretic peptide right and things like that so there's also other marker treatments as well that we need to keep in mind so this is like an overview for what we roughly need to do as we translate all the steps that we need to do as stated in the guideline we realize that for all chemo drugs Obviously, we need to identify the risk factors. If there's any comorbidities of the heart, like coronary artery disease, heart failure, um, hypertension, and also we have to treat them and manage them. So if there's QT prolongation, again, we have to monitor to avoid uh, the occurrence of arrhythmia and try to minimize cardiac irradiation, um, to, which sometimes may be difficult, isn't it? Right? Depends on the site of cancer per se. As mentioned earlier, so exercise is always a good suggestion to all cardio patients, right? Whether they have cancer or not. So because a lot of studies have already proven that exercise brings a positive effect, a good effect to the body and to the heart function. So it brings um, greater muscle strength, better immune function, um, better mood as well, because that's um, endorphin release and reduction and side effects of um, the chemotherapy drugs as well and also it reduces the stress anxiety and all because obviously we all know that um, to go through a chemotherapy regimen is not and not the easiest thing on earth so it could be challenging at certain times so it's something that if the person could, is fit enough to do exercise even just small ones for short durations along the day if we can bring them some happiness and some strength, that would be a positive way to actually reduce, as shown in reduced hospitalization duration and improve the possible outcome of the treatment as well. Now let's move on to the specific drugs in a way. So the first one that we have to talk about, um, it's anthracyclines because of its popularity. So anthracyclines, if you actually work in a sterile complex where we need to do reconstitution of the chemotherapy drugs, um, because bear in mind we, as pharmacists in a way, um, this is what <laughs> we, one of the department that we could work at, um, <clears throat> whereby we will prepare the appropriate dose and all for those uh, cancer patients who are confirmed that they will proceed for the cancer treatment the next day. So normally the patient will come in early in the morning on the chemo day. So we have to prepare it, um, the evening before it. So it's ready to be used the first thing in the morning when the patient comes in. Um, so anthracyclines is something that we like. <laughs> it's just a way to clear boredom in a way uh, when we do uh, reconstitution because of its color right so it's much easier to check whether you know we do it correctly or not um, because of its color so it's easy to see its color code in a way especially like doxo it be and so it's a red color it's the bright red um, that you can see for example for your fire extinguisher is that kind of bright red 
right? So uh, doxorubicin is used in a lot of cancers like breast, bladder, and also some leukemias, as mentioned earlier on. Some people even call the anthracyclines as red devils because of its color and because of the effects that it can cause. It's like a devil. So uh, before you actually initiate the treatment for the oncologist, so they will definitely go through some um, evaluation like so they'll do some uh, biomarkers so these are the common biomarkers like troponin or that to make sure the heart function is okay it's good enough so just to increase the resolution of this part um, so we, the first thing that you definitely need to establish is the ejection fraction right so if it's too low so we'll, we won't even start the treatment for anthracyclines because um, the risk of making the situation worse is very, very high. Some in the borderline of halfway through, we actually start the treatment before um, of drugs like ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker and or with beta blockers before the treatment because we know that these two classes of drug have a strong evidence to prove that to maintain the cardiac function. Right, These are the two drugs which are also used in heart failure very frequently. Right, so if they are exposed to multiple cardiotoxic agents with a normal function, so we may consider the drug. So all this will be um, evaluated along the whole treatment process. Right, so these are the things that we might need to we might need to give a different drug called dex dexrazosane as well. So which we're going to talk about it later. So from the chart just now, which is the first half of the, the whole diagram for here. So then we move on. So we can see that, so it depends on the dose that the person is will receive, right? So accumulative dosing is something that um, is important, especially for anthracycline group. So this is the information that could be a little bit tricky to collect because it depends on the patient, um, because this is a cumulative life dose in a way. So, the person that comes to the oncology clinic may be a recurrent patient, so you actually need to dig out the first treatment, what the person has received right from the previous notes, which can occur, I don't know, five years ago or longer, or maybe at a different clinic or different, sorry, a different oncology clinic or a different hospital altogether, right? So these are the information as a pharmacist in a way that we'll try to collect to actually calculate the exact cumulative dose that the person has already received to know how we can tailor the treatment for this round if it's required during the recurrent, right? So um, along the way, you can see again, there's a lot of, uh, again, monitoring of um, the cardiac markers like troponin to make sure the heart is functioning well. And there's always evaluation after six months, one year and two years and, and so on and so forth. So again, monitoring the signs and the cardiac biomarkers is a routine for those who actually have to receive anthracycline drugs. Um, in the guideline, this table is a summary on the different efficacy of cardiotoxicity for the drugs, different drugs under the anthracycline group. So you can see doxorubicin is the king <laughs> in a way, so followed by Ipiru Downo as well. Um, so the incidence of heart failure here increases when there's an increase of the cumulative dose, as mentioned earlier on. So bear in mind, this is a re irreversible damage. As if you remember the chart that we look at uh, for the mechanism section. So the higher the dose, so obviously in each infusion that the person receives, so there'll be one round of a little bit of minor damage. So the second round of receiving it, you get another round of damage and it goes on and on. Um, accumulatively stacking all up. So therefore, it's something that we need to keep in mind as well. Um, again, because of its popularity, it's widely used. So the chances of accumulating the dose along the way is actually quite high. How do we prevent it? So the first thing, the easiest thing that we can do by calculation is to limit the cumulative dose. So therefore, for those high-risk patients as as you've seen earlier on in the chart, if the ejection fraction is too low, we'll just omit this whole drug um, or we just change the chemo regimen for the person. Right? So the second one is to use uh, different formulations right? and uh, dox, 
doxorazine as an alternative as well. And the last part over here, so this part we'll talk a little bit more in the later slides. So the last part over here is about the standard treatment that we we'll need to give to heart failure patients. We'll also be given to this group of um, patients as well, right? like the standard statins and all, which are used to maintain a better cardiac function. So we already know that um, antracycline groups are effective, useful oncology drugs, right? and it causes this terrible effect as higher risk of causing cardiotoxicity. So what the scientists did was we actually um, managed to design a drug called dexrazosane. So what happens is that this drug is actually um, can provide some cardio protection right, for the high risk patients. Um, so what can the drug do is that it'll actually, it's actually being given um, as before doxorubicin is given, so like half an hour before it's given. So the patient actually received dexrazosane first, then followed by the doxorubicin treatment. So how does this dexrazosane work? So basically it um, sort of blocks the effect of the antracycline. So in this diagram, A refers to antracycline, right? So the D refers to this dexrazosane. So this particular molecule here is actually called topoisomerase 2 beta, uh, which is the target of antracycline because the antracycline inhibits the effect of this topoisomerase causing the DNA double-stranded breaks and so on. So dexrazosane actually prevents the binding of doxorubicin to this target. So to reverse, to reduce the incidence of cardiotoxicity. So another way that it can work is that before it actually enters the cardiomyocytes, this particular drug actually binds to iron, right? So it prevents the iron antracycline complex formation, therefore to prevent or reduce the free radical formation. So these are the two main mechanisms. However, when we look at it, um, it's not 100% protection, unfortunately, because uh, antracycline is a drug uh, that, yes, we know its main mechanism of action, but there's a, there's a lot of other smaller branches of ways that the drug can apply, that can cause in causing cytotoxic effects on the cancer cells. That's why it's so effective. Right, so the effect of dexrazosine is not complete in terms of its cardioprotection. So this particular drug is first being um, licensed to be given to those women with advanced breast cancer who has uh, already received a cumulative doxo dose, but we can't really find another replacement to change the chemo regimen. So this is what it's first being approved for. Uh, later along the years, so it's also being approved for children later on as well, uh, that has again uh, received a higher dose of antracycline already. So initially this was a bit of controversial because it seems that dexrazosine maybe uh, has certain risk of causing uh, secondary cancers. So it wasn't being first approved for children, but the clinical evidence now it seems better. So it's approved for children use as well. Another way that we can go about for cardiotoxicity is to use a different formulation uh, for doxorubicin. So an easier way um, due to the advancement of pharmaceutical is that we can wrap up the drug in using liposomes. So the, the concept is whereby we can pack the drug inside a package. So when we can put in targets and all that, we can try to send this drug with the target to its site that it should be at a higher concentration, which are the cancer cells. So you can say, hello, you go and exert your cytotoxic effect in the cancer cells, but not on the other friends that we don't want it to occur. So there are two um, clinically approved brands. Someone is non pg related right? So one is pg related So for one of it is this Carlex. So this is the structure um, of the drug per se. So there's some uh, videos that you can find that talks about it as well, right? So in general, liposomes actually try to avoid the direct contact of the cytotoxic agent while it's in the distribution phase, so it's packed up, so it, it will not really um, have a direct contact with the endothelial cells while it's going around in the body, right? so it reduces the cytotoxic effects and you use the leakiness of the 
endothelium because in the cancer cells, um, the endothelial cells, they're actually more leaky in a way. So there's uh, greater gap junctions because the cancer cells, normally they, are, um, they, are grow, they grow in a more aggressive way. So they will actually want to pull in more nutrients for their sites. So it's in another way. So while it's trying to pull in nutrients, so they'll try the liposomes with the anthracycline or doxorubicin drug can actually flow in together to have a higher concentration at these sites, at the cancer cell sites. Next, we'll move on to other drugs other than anthracycline. So the other two drugs which are also at a higher risk that can cause cardiotoxicity is the anti-HER2 compounds, which is the human epidermal receptor 2, and also the VEGF, which is the vascular endothelial growth factor. So these are the drugs which can target these two. So again, if and bear in mind, these two drugs are commonly being used for breast cancer treatment as well. So again, you have to monitor the combination effect of, of different drugs right, being used that can cause a similar cardiotoxicity profile. So again, the risk factors are quite similar, as mentioned earlier on, any pre-existing cardio conditions for the patient is um, a sign that you need to monitor them more frequently. Similarly, when we look at the charts, so like HER2 inhibitors like trastuzumab and all this are getting more and more popular as well because like trastuzumabs, there's a biosimilar available which reduces its cost. So um, again, if they are ejection fraction as well, so as you can see, it's quite similar on the way uh, that you manage, you know, compared to um, those receiving a trastuzumab. So again, you monitor their ejection fraction and you may start certain drugs for them as a protective effect. Looking at the second half of the chart from the one on top, as you can see over here, so again, continual um, monitoring right, and evaluation is always the key for any signs and symptoms and also biomarker elevation, just in case there is. Similarly, when we look at the VEGF1s and other monoclonal antibodies, as you can see, again, evaluation before initiation of the treatment to know whether we should give these drugs to patient A or not and also continual monitoring at least um, so for three months first and every six months to see in, in case there's anything that we can pick up for any early detection and management. This table here actually summarized that uh, besides the effect, the direct effect of injury towards the heart per se, um, recent studies already have shown that um, major VEGF inhibitors can actually increase the risk of hypertension for the individual. So if the person who received this treatment already have a pre-existing pre hypertension, high blood pressure condition, so it's again you something that you have to monitor their blood pressure more frequently because it's very likely, as you can see, the percentage um, the blood pressure control will be more and more difficult so you might need to step bear in mind you have to step up the treatment for the blood pressure control right in terms of increasing the number of drugs that you might give for the, for the hypertension uh, management right as you can see it's actually quite high in a way hmm. Looking at other tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which are again getting more and more popular in the oncology treatment. These are new classes of drugs. So you can see it depends, the risk depends on which drug that uh, the person is receiving. So some are at very high cardiovascular risk, so it has to be monitored very, very closely. Some again, it's similar monitoring like the other drugs that we talked about earlier on. Another class of new drugs, here we look at the proteasome inhibitors as some examples over here, like proteasomib. So again, pre-treatment evaluation and continuous monitoring for symptoms and also cardiac biomarkers like BNP would be sufficient for this group of people. Over here, we look at a name, a drug in a way called Ibrutinib. So this is again a newer drug. So why do I need to put it specifically is that um, the cardiotoxicity risk for this drug is a little bit special whereby it actually increases the risk of atrial fibrillation. So it's not really so much on 
uh, the ejection fraction um, or myocardial infarction kind of effect, but it's on atrial fibrillation risk will be higher. So you see the monitoring will be a little bit different in a way. So when we look at more into details, this is by this paper. Um, you can see, I'm sorry for the small print. Um, so you can see that uh, you have to, because atrial fibrillation, if you actually go through the, the videos already, right, or you have to actually learn about atrial fibrillation already, um, it actually brings a higher risk of um, blood clotting, so which is a bit different. So this is just to remind the usage of anticoagulants for this group of patients if you already found that there is already some development of atrial fibrillation. Right, so you can it's advisable to use drugs like beta blockers to control or manage the symptom of atrial fibrillation as well. Last but not least, we'll look at another group of oncology drugs which are getting more and more popular, which is called the immune checkpoint inhibitors. So that's again the newer classes of drug. So you can see, as usual, we monitor their ECG, troponin and all, because the main effect of cardiotoxicity that we look at is actually myocarditis. So it's something, again, um, we try to pick it up early, then we can, if it actually occurs, we can stop the treatment as soon as possible. Right? Again, it's not that everyone would, every patient which receives this immune checkpoint inhibitors will develop this, but there's a higher risk, so we have to monitor accordingly. Right. In the last section over here, uh, we'll actually be talking about what to do if a cardiotoxicity is observed. So what we talked about earlier on is more like uh, active monitoring and to pick up any um, symptoms earlier on or any biomarker elevation so that we can decide what to do. So now is that what do we actually need to do if it really occurs? Based on the guidelines, so the first one we look at uh, is the most common one, which is the reduction in the ejection fraction. So you can see that if it reduces by 10%, Point or to a value of less than 50% or if it's at more than 50% if it's a reduction by 20% point so we have to evaluate whether it's a asymptomatic one or symptomatic one right so obviously if they're symptomatic when the patient actually experiences breathlessness and all it's something that you have to um, give more aggressive treatment along the way so if it's asymptomatic right so we can maybe still continue, so depends on the level, maybe we can still continue the intracycline treatment, all right? And obviously monitor, continue the monitoring. But if it's lower, as you can see over here, if it's symptomatic, we'll just have to stop the treatment and change to other drugs for the oncology side, and also to initiate um, ACE inhibitors and beta blocker as soon as possible, right? To maintain or keep the function the remaining function of the heart as well because remember it's an irreversible damage that we are looking at next we'll look at um, other cardiotoxicity effects in this case uh, it's mainly on the possible occurrence of acute coronary syndrome like any angina or any heart attack in a way or myocardial infarction so if if touch wood, if that occurs, so you get an increase in the troponin level and or some uh, drop on the GLS, which is the on the heart function, one of the heart function parameters, which can be measured uh, with echo as well. So if if it occurs, so again, we'll probably have to stop the stop the administration, right? So we have to evaluate first to see whether we should uh, continue with the, the treatment and also to initiate. Um, ACE inhibitors or beta blockers again um, and monitor right and hopefully if it's all um, okay and stabilized there's no symptoms and all then we can consider to continue the same cancer treatment again. Next is on hypertension remember um, in earlier on one of the drug classes that we look at so it can actually increase has a very high risk of increasing the blood pressure right although there's no direct so much of a direct damage to the heart so um, again we have to manage the person like any other uh, hypertension person so as if in case the pressure increased to a very high level until it 
enters the hypertensive emergency or any uh, acute organ damage so we have to manage um, ASAP right uh, and under the same way as how we manage a hypertension emergency right so you have to give infusion of uh, and certain antihypertensives again and to push the value down right and then we can see if things are okay uh, there's certain treatment that we in have to initiate, right? Certain drugs that we need to initiate if it has not been given for the patient yet. And we'll decide how severe is the situation, whether to continue the treatment or not. Right, so you can see in general, it's always monitoring, see what to do. And there's certain parameters that uh, criteria in a way that the person need to hit to see whether we should stop the treatment or not. Another one that we look at is the myocarditis. So this is something that uh, we actually need to treat more urgently, right? So as you can see here, the because the it can occur, it can re, because myocarditis if it occurs, it can actually reduce the heart function very very drastically in a very short period of time. That can cause uh, acute heart failure. So um, we have to treat it very very aggressively. So stop the treatment, admission to the coronary care unit right to see um, what we can give them right like prednisolones and things to reduce the inflammation and maybe other drugs as well as supportive to see how good is the recovery and so on if there is an issue with this so the person will not get any further immune checkpoint inhibitors drugs in their further cycles as well because if the chances of a reoccurring myocarditis from the same drug is almost confirmed. In this slide, it's more like a reminder, although the risk is slightly lower compared to the incidence of other um, types of cardiotoxicity, it's about pulmonary hypertension. So again, we try to monitor for all the parameters for pulmonary hypertension as well. So to make sure all is okay, in case if it occurs, then we can pick it up and detect much faster. Over here, it's a subsection in a way on specifically on drug-induced arrhythmia because it's actually given quite some emphasis in the guidelines as well. So I decided to put it as a mini subsection. Cardiac arrhythmias. So it's basically a huge family on the different types of arrhythmia. Um, arrhythmia, by definition, refers to a change in the tempo or the rhythm, right? So some of it is more not life-threatening, like bradycardia, that refers to a slower heartbeat in a way. But when you look at the PQRST pattern, it's actually still the same. So it's just a slower heartbeat, but the overall contraction and relaxation for the different heart chambers chambers still the same so the heart pumping and ejection fraction is still awesome <laughs> but it's just as but it's just at a slower rate however when we look through we go through at the lower part of the table as you can see we've got ventricular fibrillation and sudden cardiac death so these are the no-nos that we want to avoid altogether or prevent because when you look at the PQRST pattern, there's no more pattern, especially look at the fibrillation, you can see the pattern is upside down. So there's very, very high risk of sudden cardiac death because uh, the heart pumping effect is just gone because it, it doesn't pump in a synchronized way. So although the heart is beating, but it's very, the whole thing is messy. So uh, it's not a relaxation of the atria then caused by a contraction of the ventricular when the, when the blood flows out so it can go out. So the sudden cardiac death occurs when there's actually no blood flow in a way. So the heart is pumping but the flow is not there. So which is um, something urgent that we need to tackle. As you can see, there's lots of causative drugs that can cause all this. Uh, another one of atrial fibrillation is something that uh, we see earlier on. So again, if it's fib atrial fibrillation, maybe we need to manage the, the rhythm of it. Not It may be a pharmacological intervention. It may be other uh, intervention for all arrhythmia like uh, pacemaker and things like that. Right. But bear in mind, uh, if it's a confirmed atrial fibrillation, we actually need to give um, anticoagulants to those patients as well. Right. 
to prevent the formation of clot and also stroke formation from occurring. So these are the drugs that can actually cause a prolong of QT interval, right, which can has a higher risk to precipitate the ventricular arrhythmia, which is the more dangerous ones. So these are the ones in the list that we have to keep in mind a little bit more. As you can see, doxorubicin is also in the list, and there's also some of the newer uh, drugs like the histone deacetylase inhibitors and also the tyrosine kinase inhibitors for some of it. So again, something we need to monitor. So um, again, it's more on the counselling side as well to the patient if you feel something not right. So we have to tell the cardiologist or the oncologist as soon as possible. So we can do appropriate tests to confirm to know what exactly has happened. QT prolongation, um, for it to occur, to, for QT prolongation to translate it into the dangerous arrhythmia, there's actually some um, other factors like, for example, the electrolyte concentrations and all that. Um, we can actually try to manage to reduce the risk, right? So if there's any uh, electrolyte imbalance of the, pot uh, the potassium ion, yes, the calcium and magnesium one, so we can correct it and give the infusion accordingly, right? Um, there's also um, certain concurrent use of QT prolongation drugs that will try to avoid its usage. And if there's any hypothyroidism, then we can um, treat it accordingly with drugs. So there are some which are non-correctable ones. So again, we will try to manage as much as possible. Over here, when we look at the details on how should we manage a QT prolongation, so a simple way in a way is to know how much is it being prolonged. So we need to do an ECG and to see how much is it prolonged for in terms of the milliseconds. So if it's severe enough, so we have to withhold the cancer treatment or on the second and the third option over here. So if it's okay, it's not too bad and there's no ventricular arrhythmia, so we can continue the cancer treatment and to correct and any risk factors, right, and monitor continuously as well. So on the severe side, so we have to stop it and therefore definitive, especially the more severe ones. And over here, we can still discuss accordingly. And again, you have to correct all the risk factors, no matter what senior scenario you are in. Right. Another part over here is a little bit different topic on venous thromboembolism. So again, it's more like a clotting of the blood, as actually, right? That can, um, you know, causes a blockage or your DV, your DVT and things like that. So um, for certain cancers, due to the treatment that is received or due to the nature of cancer per se, so. Um, like for example, in the pancreas and so on, can actually causes a higher risk of all this. So again, um, it's something that we need to keep in mind. If there's a higher risk of so, then we have to manage accordingly with anticoagulants. Thank you very much for staying till the end till of the video. And I hope that the information has been useful for you too as a revision or if it's a new topic for you. So you're welcome to subscribe to the channel and uh, to turn on the bell. And you can follow me on Facebook or on Instagram and also TikTok as well. See ya. Thank you very much.